Welcome to the reading of the Sabbath School lesson for the third quarter of 2024. Welcome to the reading of lesson number 13 of the Sabbath School lessons on the book of Mark. This lesson is titled The Risen Lord and is ready for teaching on Sabbath, September 28. The author is Dr. Thomas R. Shepherd of Andrews University, and your reader today is Dr. Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, September 21. Before we start, let's pray. O oh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gracious stories that we read in this book of Mark. We thank you that as we open your word to that book this week, to the very final chapter, that we may see what not only did Jesus do, but the result it had in the lives of those about him. And as we read, we pray that our lives may be changed, that we may see the importance of what he did to the world and also to us. And today I'd like to pray for the City Pathfinder Club in St Thomas in the Virgin Islands, for Anita Santos and her family, for Konzani Delamini of, of uh, Zimbabwe, for Delcy Dame and her family, for Alana Andrews and her family, for Doreen Hines of Jamaica and her mother Beverly Williams. Lord, each of us needs your prayers, and these are just some of the people who've asked for prayer, and I pray that you will be with them and bless them today. May they know that you were the friend who decided to come and provide salvation for each of them. Bless us now as we open your word. May the Holy Spirit enlighten our lives, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our memory text this week comes from Mark chapter 16, verse 6. But he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. And here is Dr. Jenny reading it again for us today. I'm Jenny from Harvey Bay, and our memory verse is from Mark chapter 16, verse 6. But he said to them, do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. Mark chapter 16 verse 6. The crucifixion of Jesus destroys the hopes and faith of his disciples. It was a dark weekend for them as they not only grappled with their master's death, but feared for their own lives as well, as we read in John 20 verse 19. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. In Mark chapter 16, the final chapter in this gospel, we will look at what followed his death. First, we will look at the timing of Jesus' resurrection and why the women came to the tomb on that Sunday morning. Adventists have sometimes shied away from resurrection morning because of the way it is misused to support Sunday sacredness. We will instead see how we can rejoice in the Sunday resurrection, despite the false theology that has unfortunately arisen from it. Second, the lesson explains the first verses of Mark 16, linking these words to a theme that runs through the entire book. Our studies on Monday and Tuesday will look at these concepts. Third, Wednesday and Thursday, will examine the rest of Mark 16 and consider the mission it sets before us. This study will close with a challenge to the reader of Mark to take the gospel throughout the world. Sunday, September 22, Rejoicing in the Resurrection Read Mark chapter 15, verses 42 through to chapter 16, verse 6. What happens here, and why is this story so relevant to the resurrection narrative? Let's begin at Mark 15 and verse 42. It was preparation day, that is, the day before the Sabbath, so as evening approached, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent member of the council who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, 
went boldly to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. Pilate was surprised to hear that he was already dead. Summoning the centurion, he asked him if Jesus had already died. When he learned from the centurion that it was so, he gave the body to Joseph. So Joseph bought some fine lit cloth, took down the body, wrapped it in the linen and placed it in a tomb cut out of rock. Then he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of Joseph saw where he was laid. And then we begin chapter 16. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome bought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they went on their way to the tomb and they asked each other, Who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. All the Gospel writers agree that Jesus died on the day that they identify as the preparation, as we read in Matthew twenty-seven sixty-two. The next day, the one after preparation day, the chief priests and the Pharisees went to Pilate. And then Mark chapter 15, verse 42, it was preparation day, that is the day before the Sabbath, so as evening approached, and then Luke 23, verse 54, it was preparation day and the Sabbath was about to begin. And John 19, verse 14, it was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about noon. Here is your king, Pilate said to the Jews. And verse 31, now it was the day of preparation and the next day was to be a special Sabbath. Because the Jewish leaders did not want the bodies left on the crosses during the Sabbath, they asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies brought down. And then John 19 verse 42, Because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. Most commentators understand this as a reference to sunset Thursday through to sunset Friday. Jesus died late on Friday afternoon and was then quickly buried before sunset. During the Sabbath, the Lord rested in the grave and all of Jesus' disciples rested as well. As it says in Luke twenty-three fifty-six, and they rested on the Sabbath according to the commandment. A rather strange action if, in fact, Jesus had lessened, at least in their minds, the obligation to keep the fourth commandment. On Saturday night, the women bought spices and on Sunday morning they went to the tomb with the desire to complete the typical burial process. Of course, Jesus was not there. As early as the second century, Christians saw significance in the fact that Jesus rose on Sunday. This became the basis for Sunday sacredness. But is that what the New Testament teaches? Read Colossians chapter 2, verses 10 to 12. What is the New Testament memorial of Jesus' resurrection? Colossians 2, beginning at verse 10. And in Christ you have been brought to fullness. He is the head over every power and authority. In him you were also circumcised with a circumcision not performed by human hands. Your whole self, ruled by the flesh, was put off when you were circumcised by Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him, through your faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. Not a word in the Bible hints at Sunday sacredness as a memorial of the resurrection. That memorial is baptism. As we read in Romans 6 verse 4, Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, 
even so, we also should walk in newness of life. Regardless of the false theology regarding Sunday worship, as Adventists, we must rejoice in the Sunday morning resurrection of Jesus. Jesus has triumphed over death, and in his resurrection, we have the surety of ours. And so to finish the day, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. 1 Peter 1 verse 3. Look at the certainty Paul had about the resurrection of Jesus. How can we have that certainty as well? Monday, September 23, the stone was rolled away. Read Mark chapter 16, verses 1 to 8, and 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 to 8. What do these passages have in common? First of all, Mark 16, beginning at verse 1. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome bought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb, and they asked each other, Who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said, You were looking for Jesus the Nazarene, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter, He is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. And 1 Corinthians 15, beginning at verse 1. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved, if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. For what I received I passed on to you, as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and then he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the Twelve. After that he appeared to more than five hundred of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all he appeared to me also, as to one abnormally born. The story of the resurrection appears in each of the Gospels. Each Gospel writer presents the story from a different perspective. They all contain the core concepts that appear again in 1 Corinthians 15 verses 1 to 8. Four ideas appear again and again. Died, buried, risen, seen. In Mark, died and buried are in chapter 15. The risen and seen appear in chapter 16, but with a twist. Mark 16 verse 7 speaks of a meeting in Galilee. And that reads, But go, tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. And it says, And there you will see him. Well, that's recounted in John chapter 21. Let's read that. Afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, also known as Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them. And they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, 
friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, It is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off, and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it, and some bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish you have just caught. So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, one hundred and fifty-three. But even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, Come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, Who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread and gave it to them, and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he had raised him from the dead. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, Feed my lambs. Again Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, Take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, Do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things, you know that I love you. Jesus said, Feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the type of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. Peter turned and saw that the disciple whom Jesus loved was following them. This was the one who had leaned back against Jesus at the supper and had said, Lord, who is going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he asked, Lord, what about him? Jesus answered, If I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You must follow me. Because of this, the rumour spread among the believers that this disciple would not die. But Jesus did not say that he would not die. He only said, If I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? This is the disciple who testifies of these things and who wrote them down. We know that his testimony is true. Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that even the whole world would not have room for the books that would be written. Some people find it incredible that Christians believe in a risen Lord, but the evidence for his resurrection is substantial and consistent with reason. For starters, all one has to do is believe in God as the Creator, as we read in Genesis 1 and 2, and the idea of the resurrection of a miracle become reasonable. The God who created the universe and then life on earth certainly had the power, if he chose, to resurrect Jesus. The existence of God doesn't make the resurrection of Jesus inevitable, only reasonable. Next, the tomb was definitely empty. Even atheist historians accept that fact. If it were not, the claim about his resurrection would fail right from the start because the existence of his body there would destroy any claims of him having risen. Next, the explanation that his disciples stole the body does not work. The disciples surely couldn't have gotten past the guards. And, even if they had done so and got the body, why were the disciples never arrested for stealing it? The answer is that the religious leaders knew that the disciples had not done it. 
Also, numerous people testified that they saw the risen Christ. Many, including the disciples, did not at first believe. And one very solid enemy, Paul, not only claims to have seen the risen Lord, but that this experience changed the whole trajectory of his life, in very radical ways too. Finally, though there are many other reasons, how does one explain the rise of the Christian church? founded by people who claim to have seen the risen Lord. Why would these people have been willing to die for what they knew was a lie? Their consistent testimony, both right after his death and years later, provides powerful evidence for his resurrection. Right after his death, we have this in Acts 3.15, You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead, we are witnesses to this. And First Peter verse chapter 1 and verse 3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And so to finish the day, what would you say if someone were to ask you, what evidence do you have for Christ's resurrection? Tuesday, September 24, The Women at the Tomb In The Desire of Ages, page 788, we read, The women who had stood by the cross of Christ waited and watched for the hours of the Sabbath to pass. On the first day of the week, very early, they made their way to the tomb, taking with them precious spices to anoint the Saviour's body. They did not think about his rising from the dead. The sun of their hope had set, and night had settled down on their hearts. As they walked, they recounted Christ's works of mercy and his words of comfort, but they remembered not his words, I will see you again, in John 16.22, End of quote. Read Mark chapter 16, verses 1 to 8 again. What happened and how did the women first respond? Mark 16, beginning at verse 1. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome bought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb, and they asked each other, Who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You were looking for Jesus the Nazarene, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go tell his disciples and Peter, He is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone, because they were afraid. From the beginning of the Gospel, the reader knows that Jesus is the Messiah. But, in the text itself, the first non-demon-possessed person who proclaims him the Messiah is Peter, in Mark chapter 8, verse 29. But what about you? he asked. Who do you say I am? Peter answered, You are the Messiah. And this profession doesn't happen until halfway through the book. All throughout Mark's Gospel, Jesus tells people to keep quiet about who he is or about the healing that he did for them. In Mark one forty four, he tells a leper to tell no one of his healing. It reads, See that you don't tell this to anyone, but go, show yourself to the priest, and offer the sacrifices that Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. 
In Mark 5.43, he tells Jairus and his wife to tell no one of the raising of their daughter. And that reads, He gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this and told them to give her something to eat. In Mark 7.36, he tells a group not to tell people about his healing of a deaf and mute man. And that reads, Jesus commanded them not to tell anyone. But the more he did so, the more they kept talking about it. And then he commands his disciples not to tell people that he is the Messiah. In Mark 8.30, Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. And also in Mark chapter 9, verse 9, As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus gave them orders not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. No doubt the main reason for Jesus telling them to be silent was to allow himself the time to finish his ministry according to the time prophecies of Daniel 9, 24-27. Now, in this scene, even after they've been told that Jesus had been raised, the women, fearful and amazed, fled from the tomb, and at least at first didn't talk about what had happened either. The silence, however, didn't last long. By the time we reach the end of the book of Mark, we read this in chapter 16, verse 20. And they went out and preached everywhere, while the Lord worked with them and confirmed the message by accompanying signs. Thus, the motif of being silent about Jesus and about who he is and what he has done is shattered. The book ends with them preaching everywhere. And so to finish the day, why must we not keep silent about Jesus and what he has done? Who can you tell today about Jesus and the plan of salvation? Wednesday, September 25, Appearing to Mary and Others Read Mark chapter 16, verses 9 to 20. What do these verses add to the resurrection story? Well, let's begin at Mark 16 and verse 9. When Jesus rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had driven seven demons. She went and told those who had been with him and who were mourning and weeping. When they heard that Jesus was alive and that she had seen him, they did not believe it. Afterward, Jesus appeared in a different form to two of them while they were walking in the country. These returned and reported it to the rest, but they did not believe them either. Later, Jesus appeared to the eleven as they were eating. He rebuked them for their lack of faith and their stubborn refusal to believe those who had seen him after he had risen. He said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name they will drive out demons, they will speak in new tongues, they will pick up snakes with their hands, and when they drink deadly poison, it will not hurt them at all. They will place their hands on sick people, and they will get well. After the Lord Jesus had spoken to them, he was taken up into heaven, and he sat at the right hand of God. Then the disciples went out and preached everywhere, and the Lord worked with them and confirmed his word by signs that accompanied it. Almost all of Mark 16, verses 9 to 20, has parallels in other passages in the New Testament. First of all, Mary Magdalene at the tomb, seeing Jesus, we read about that in Matthew 28 and verse 1, after the Sabbath at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb, and verses 9 and 10, suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. And John 20, verses 11 to 18. 
and that reads, Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white, seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, Woman, why are you crying? Who is it you were looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers, and tell them I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. And we'll compare that with Luke chapter 8 and verse 2. And also some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases, Mary called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had come out. Two disciples see him in the countryside, and we read that in Luke 24, verses 13 to 35. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. But they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, What are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things? he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early in the morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said. But they did not see Jesus. He said to them, How foolish are you, and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going farther, but they urged him strongly, Stay with us, for it is nearly evening, the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, Were not our hearts burning within us, while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together, and saying, It is true, the Lord has risen, and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told them what had happened on the way, and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. And the eleven disciples are commissioned, as we read in Matthew 28, verses 16 to 20. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son 
and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. And the same in Luke 24, verses 36 to 49. While they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be unto you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, Why are you troubled, and why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they still did not believe it because of joy and amazement, he asked them, Do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. He said to them, This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, This is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I am going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. And also in John chapter 20, Verses 19 to 23, on the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. The first person to see Jesus alive was Mary Magdalene. We read about that in John 20, verses 11 to 18. Other women saw him as well, as we read in Matthew 28, verses 8 to 10. Let's read that again. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid, yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. It is significant that the first people to see the risen Lord were women. Because women in the ancient world did not have high status as witnesses, if the story were fabricated, it would have been much more likely to name men as the first witnesses. But it is not men, not the twelve, but a woman. She goes to tell the good news to the disciples, but, not surprisingly, they do not believe her testimony, most likely because it seemed fantastic, and also, unfortunately, because Mary was a woman. Apologists for the resurrection story of Jesus have used this fact, that of women being the first ones to have seen Jesus, as powerful evidence for the veracity of the story. What happens in Mark 16.14 that makes no sense if this story were a fabrication? It reads, Later Jesus appeared to the eleven as they were eating. He rebuked them for their lack of faith and their stubborn refusal to believe those who had seen him after he had risen. Of course, if they were making up the story, why would they have made themselves look so bad? Jesus had to rebuke them for their hardness of heart. The gospel accounts from the time of his arrest to the appearances after the resurrection depict the followers of Jesus in a very negative light, fleeing, denying, disbelieving, and so forth. This would make no sense if the story were made up. 
In contrast, their later bold and unwavering proclamation of the risen Christ and the hope it offers everyone presents powerful evidence for the veracity of their claims. And so to finish today, how can we protect ourselves from falling into the spiritual trap of doubt and unbelief? Why must we daily link ourselves to the risen Christ? Thursday, September 26. Go into all the world. Read Mark 16, verses 14 to 20. What did Jesus say to his disciples when he appeared to them, and what do these words mean to us today? Mark 16, beginning at verse 14. Later Jesus appeared to the eleven as they were eating. He rebuked them for their lack of faith and their stubborn refusal to believe those who had seen him after he had risen. He said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name they will drive out demons, they will speak in new tongues, they will pick up snakes with their hands, and when they drink deadly poison, it will not hurt them at all. They will place their hands on sick people, and they will get well. After the Lord Jesus had spoken to them, he was taken up into heaven, and he sat at the right hand of God. Then the disciples went out and preached everywhere, and the Lord worked with them and confirmed his word by the signs that accompanied it. The first words of Jesus to his disciples are recorded only in indirect discourse in Mark 16, verse 14. He rebukes them for their unbelief and hard-heartedness. This question of unbelief is not simply a modern problem. As we already have seen, the original disciples of Jesus struggled with belief. We saw that in Matthew 28 and verse 17. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And in John 20 verses 24 to 29, now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands, and put my finger where the nails were, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came in, and stood among them, and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, see my hands, reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting, and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen, and yet have believed. And they were with Jesus in the flesh and saw again and again the miracles. But by various proofs, he demonstrated to them the reality of his resurrection. Then their testimony, combined with the evidence summarized in Monday's study, forms a firm foundation for faith. Jesus then commissions his disciples to take the gospel to the world. His command is expansive. They are to go to the entire world and proclaim the gospel to all creation. Jesus then explains the outcome of their work for weal or for woe. Believers will be saved, unbelievers condemned. Jesus also describes signs that will accompany the disciples' work, casting out demons, speaking new languages, protection from harm, and healing the sick. Some people have mistakenly interpreted Mark 16:18 as an affirmation for Christians to show their faith by picking up poisonous snakes. No such presumptive action is authorized here. What Jesus is describing is protection when one is involved in mission, such as Paul's service for others, as in Acts chapter 28 and verses 3 to 6. Let's read that. Paul gathered a pile of brushwood, and as he put it on the fire, a viper, driven out by the heat, fastened itself on his hand. 
When the islanders saw the snake hanging from his hand, they said to each other, This man must be a murderer, for though he escaped from the sea, the goddess Justice has not allowed him to live. But Paul shook the snake off into the fire and suffered no ill effects. The people, expecting him to swell up or suddenly fall dead, but after waiting a long time and seeing nothing unusual happening to him, they changed their minds and said he was a god. Of course, the Bible does not teach that Christians will always be protected from harm. At times, God sees fit to work a miracle to further the gospel cause, but sometimes Christians suffer because of their witness. In that circumstance, their patient endurance is another sign to unbelievers of the power of faith. And then, after doing all he did here, he was received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. Mark 16, verse 19. Jesus ascended to sit at the right hand of God, the place of supreme power, for Jesus had defeated all the forces of evil. Notice the last verse. Though they went everywhere preaching the gospel, they did not go alone. Verse 20 reads, The Lord working with them and confirming the word through the accompanying signs. Amen. He was with them and promises to be with us now as we continue the work they started. And so to finish the day, Matthew twenty-eight twenty reads, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. What comfort can and should we take from this promise as we, too, seek to proclaim the gospel everywhere? Friday, September 27, Further Thought We read in The Desire of Ages, page 786 and 787, and these are mostly... Uh, verses quoted directly from the Bible, this, To the believer, Christ is the resurrection and the life. In our Saviour, the life that was lost through sin is restored, for he has life in himself to quicken whom he will. He is invested with the right to give immortality. The life that he laid down in humanity, he takes up again and gives to humanity. I am come, he said, that they might have life, and that they might have it more abundantly. Whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. That's John 10.10, 10, John 4.14, 4, and John 6.54. To the believer, death is but a small matter. Christ speaks of it as if it were of little moment. If a man keep my saying, he shall never see death. He shall never taste of death. To the Christian, death is but a sleep a moment of silence and darkness. The life is hid with God in Christ, and when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. And that's quoting from John eight fifty one and 52, and Colossians 3, verse 4. End of quote from The Desire of Ages. Even atheist historians, those who cannot accept the reality of the resurrection, admit not only that Jesus had been killed, but that after his death, many people claimed to have seen the resurrected Christ, and as a result, they began the nucleus of what became the Christian Church. Some, in an attempt to explain why they claimed this, said that Jesus had a twin brother, or that the early disciples hallucinated, thinking that they saw Jesus. Others said that Jesus never really died, but only swooned and then later revived. Another person claimed that aliens came down and took the body. For a look at all these arguments and how they don't work, see Clifford Goldstein's book, Risen, Finding, Hope in the Empty Tomb, published in 2021. And Clifton Goldstein is the editor of the Sabbath School pamphlet that we're reading from right here today.
And that brings us to our three discussion questions for this week. One, why would the disciples have lied about the resurrection of Jesus? From all that we know, they faced nothing but hatred, alienation and persecution for their belief. What would they have gained by making this story up? Two, what evidence of Jesus' resurrection is most convincing to you? Share your reasons with your class. And three, dwell more on the great hope that Jesus' resurrection offers us. Read 1 Corinthians chapter 15. How much importance does Paul put on the resurrection of Jesus? So let's read all 58 verses of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved, if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. For what I received I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the Twelve. After that he appeared to more than five hundred of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all he appeared to me also, as to one abnormally born. For I am the least of the apostles, and do not even deserve to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by grace of God I am what I am, and his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Whether then it is I or they, this is what we preach, and this is what you believed. But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God, for we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But he did not raise him if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. But... Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the firstfruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in turn, Christ the firstfruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him. Then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father after he has destroyed all dominion, authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death, for he has put everything under his feet. Now, when it says that everything has been put under him, it is clear that this does not include God himself who put everything under Christ. When he has done this, then the Son himself will be made subject to him who put everything under him, so that God may be all in all. Now, if there is no resurrection, what will those do who are baptized for the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, why are people baptized for them? And, as for us, why do we endanger ourselves every hour? I face death every day, yes, just as surely as I boast about you in Christ Jesus our Lord. If I fought wild beasts in Ephesus with no more than human hopes, what have I gained? If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Come back to your senses as you ought and stop sinning, for there are some who are ignorant of God, 
I say this to your shame. But someone will ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body will they come? How foolish! What you sow does not come to life unless it dies. When you sow, you do not plant the body that will be, but just a seed, perhaps of wheat or something else. But God gives it a body as he has determined, and to each kind of seed he gives its own body. Not all flesh is the same. People have one kind of flesh, animals have another, birds another, and fish another. There are also heavenly bodies, and there are earthly bodies. But the splendour of the heavenly bodies is one kind, and the splendour of the earthly bodies is another. The sun has one kind of splendour, the moon another, and the stars another, and star differs from star in splendour. So will it be with the resurrection of the dead. The body that is sown is perishable. It is raised imperishable. It is sown in dishonour. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. So it is written, The first man, Adam, became a living being, the last Adam, a life-giving spirit. The spiritual did not come first, but the natural, and after that the spiritual. The first man was of the dust of the earth, the second man is of heaven. As was the earthly man, so are those who are of the earth, and as is the heavenly man, so also are those who are of heaven. And just as we have borne the image of the earthly man, so shall we bear the image of the heavenly man. I declare to you, brothers and sisters, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable, which clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm, let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labour in the Lord is not in vain. And this brings us to the end of the quarter. This reading of the Adult Bible Study Guide marks 17 years of being podcast around the world on the internet as a reading of the Adult Bible Study Guide. It also marks 28 years of me reading these lessons for the blind. And for those of you who are listening, I just am so glad that I've been able to provide this service and that God has given me the health and the strength to do so. And you know, I'd like to finish once again with that saying that I like to use so much. Remember, God is always faithful. And now it's time for Inside Story with Sibylla Harold. Thank you, Sibylla. A Church Built on Garbage by Andrew McChesney Perna faced a seemingly impossible task. He had volunteered to plant a church in an unentered district of a major South Asian city, and he didn't know where to start. He had moved to the district after volunteering to serve as a global mission pioneer. But how could he share his love for Christ with his non-Christian neighbours? God, please help, he prayed. Perna prayed for a week, but he still didn't know where to start. But he did know one thing. He couldn't stand the stench on the road outside his house. Piles of garbage and puddles of dirty rainwater mingled on the road. 
One morning he saw that the garbage had blocked the gutters and filthy water was overflowing onto the road. He decided to do something. Taking a long bamboo pole, he began picking away the trash from the gutters. As he worked, the neighbours noticed. Did the city government send you to clean the road? Someone asked. Perna replied that he had not been hired to clean the road and that he simply lived on it. The neighbours were impressed. Nobody had ever cleaned the road before. You're a good man, a neighbour said. We need you here. Don't ever leave here, another said. As he cleaned the road, Perna became a local celebrity. Everyone knew him and was talking about him. People invited him into their homes. As he met the neighbours, he learned that one man was paralysed on his left side. Perna, who had been trained in massage, offered to help. The man agreed and Perna began to give massages. Every time they met, Perna prayed and then gave a massage. The man recovered fully. Neighbours were amazed to see the man in such good health. Who healed you? they asked. Oh, it was the good man who cleans our road, the man replied. Then the neighbours really wanted to get to know Perna. They began to ask for prayers and massages. Today, Perna has accomplished the seemingly impossible and planted a church. Eleven people have been baptised and twenty others are studying the Bible. Please pray for God to help us serve him more and more. Perna said, even today I am cleaning the road. If I see garbage stuck in the drains, I clean it up. Perna lives in a veiled country that Adventist Mission is not identifying so as to protect his work among a population often hostile to Christianity. Learn more about Global Mission Pioneers on the Adventist Mission website at bit.ly slash gmp in capitals pioneers. Thank you.